Let's take a look at the experiences of a pilot who flew both the F-4 Phantom and the A-10 Warthog. Today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to take a listen to excerpts from my interview with retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Steve Ladd, who recently released his book, From Phantom to Warthog, Memoirs of a Cold War Fighter Pilot. If you want to hear the full interview, check out my podcast episode with Steve. And if you want to take a deep dive and learn a few things along the way, then you should check out his book. I will leave links to both in the description below. All right, let's get into it. We will start with what it was like to fly the F-4 Phantom after earning those coveted silver pilot wings. Well, uh, first of all, as I explained in the book, uh, the Air Force in its infinite wisdom decided that uh, the way to solve the pilot shortage was to take anybody who, uh, who got an F-4 out of pilot training and put them in the back seat for uh, a finite period of time. Bad, bad decision, in my humble opinion. It didn't make us very happy because we'd done pretty well in pilot training. We thought we ought to be on the pointy end. But uh, we, uh, we climbed in the back seat. Uh, when I went in, there were no navigators in the back seat whatsoever, just pilots. We, uh, we did our apprenticeship back there for a, for, a, for a long time, in my case, a little over two years. And then finally, we got to the point where you could really say we were flying the airplane and we moved up front. That's when it began to uh, dawn on me uh, just how great flying the F-4 was. It was all power and speed and noise. Uh, it was, a, uh, it was uh, in some cases, a very unforgiving airplane. For example, if you were maneuvering hard, putting a lot of G and a lot of angle of attack on the airplane, and uh, you threw the stick over in one direction, uh, it would snap roll in the other direction, which uh, which uh, woke you up and gave you quite a surprise. So you learned in the F-4 to keep the stick centered and to turn with the rudders. It was very, very different, but uh, but that's the way it worked. Interesting. I never knew that. So it, it's true stick and rudder flying, right? None of this uh, fly-by-wire or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Both my airplanes were like that. I am most grateful they were. I would imagine you feel much more control and much more, um, it requires much more skill to keep the airplane in the air and, and to fly it proficient. Uh, I think so. I suppose the guys that fly by wire <laughs> would disagree, but I certainly think so. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think I was very fortunate in learning and flying my entire career in an airplane that uh, that I had to control. It wasn't done by algorithms and electrics. And I, uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. And you flew the F-4 in the Vietnam War. And then later in Europe, I believe, in, you were based in Spain and would deploy over to Turkey. Can you talk about any of those experiences? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the F-4 was, well, in my humble opinion, the, the, the most versatile airplane, fighter airplane ever built. Uh, it did everything. And of course, in uh, in Southeast Asia, we were uh, we were doing uh, manual bombing. We were doing interdiction, conventional bombing, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, occasionally, got to strafe, and uh, although I never got to do it over there, uh, other guys were uh, mixing it up with MIGs and air to air. So the airplane did it all. Then when I got to Spain, we uh, we entered into the. Uh, the nuclear delivery business. And uh, as you say, we spent one month out of every three in Turkey, in Sirlik, southeastern Turkey near Adana. Uh, and uh, we sat nuke alert there. And uh, the uh, mission there was at the height of the Cold War, tensions and all that. If the balloon ever went up, our mission was to uh, lug one single centerline B 61 Y3 uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, up into the southern part of Mother Russia and uh, make a big hole. And uh, fortunately, it never happened. But uh, that's what we trained for. That's what we set alert for. And uh, and uh, that's that's what we did. Now, of course, we didn't do that all the time. Uh, in Turkey, for example, if we weren't uh, sitting on the bomb, uh, we were flying uh, air to air. We were flying conventional air to ground with uh, practice bombs on uh, bombing ranges in northern Turkey, and doing all the normal training. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, our job was to, uh, was to carry nukes at that point. I can't even imagine what the, you know, the stress and the tension and the security surrounding all of that must have been, must have been like on the base. Yeah, well, the, the, the nuclear role is, uh, is, is steeped in, 
in in rules and regulations and stipulations. So uh, you you you've got to be very very precise in uh, in what you do and what you can do. The way it worked was we uh, we had a designated target. We had the same designated target every time we went on alert. We uh, planned and we memorized that target. All everything that had to do with uh, getting there getting getting the bomb off the airplane <laughs> and if you had enough fuel departing uh and uh, we knew it by heart and uh, every two or three months uh, they would certify you at, at the home base you'd go up and uh, stand at attention in front of the wing commander and people like that and you would basically tell them exactly what your uh, what your mission profile was all about and how you were going to get there and how you were going to uh, do your job. That it was actually that was more tense than <laughs> worrying about whether or not you were actually going to fly the thing. So you flew, I guess, for about half your career, right? You flew the F four. Is that a is that a fair statement? Al- almost exactly. Twelve years in the F four, twelve years in the A ten. Can you describe to the listeners what your impression of the A ten was the first time you saw it? <laughs> yeah, it was butt ugly. Um, that's that's what came to my mind. And remember, I went into the A-10 in uh, in the in the late seventies. There was there was no Google, there was no internet, there was no way to go in and take a look at things like this uh, and ready yourself for what it was going to look like. When I far, first uh, saw the A-10, and I have to I have to contrast this with the F-4. I mean, the F-4 was was never a pretty airplane. Uh, it had strange angles. It had turned up wings. It had a droopy tail, but man, it looked mean. It really looked like a fighting machine, and it looked uh, it looked tough. When I looked at the A10, I thought, "Wow, this thing is ugly." It's got two great big engines stuck up on the fuselage, just forward of the tail, all by themselves. Uh, it's got straight wings, great big straight wings. It's got a blunt nose with this, uh, with this gun sticking out the front of it. And my image as a fighter pilot, uh, narcissistic as we all are, I thought, I really don't want to climb out of this thing in a strange air base. People will, uh, people will think I'm, I'm strange. Uh, so my f- first impression of the A-10 was not very good. But I'll have to say, uh, she seduced me, and she seduced me pretty quickly, because uh, uh, for all her for all her physical deformities, uh, the A ten is one hell of an airplane. Yeah, it has earned a very deserved reputation of you know as a rugged, dependable, tough aircraft. Yeah, I think in the book you mentioned your friend, I believe his call sign was Bear kind of convinced you to switch from the F4 to the A10. Yeah, uh when uh I was I was at RAF Bentwaters in 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 England near uh, near Ipswich at the time flying F4s. Uh when the Air Force decided that they were going to transition uh our base and our wing uh to the A10. I had been flying the F4 for a long time. I'd been to the fighter weapons school. Uh I was wearing the patch. I thought, well, that shouldn't affect me very much because I can stay with the F4 and I can I can continue to get jobs in the F4 because I've got uh, I've got pretty good street cred in this airplane and uh, and I can do that. So without applying a whole lot of logic or reason, uh, I decided that that's what I was going to do. They gave us a choice: we could either uh, we we could either uh, upgrade to the A10 or we could stick with the F4 and uh, follow her wherever she might go. But my initial decision was, ah, I'm going to stay with the F-4. I, I know it like the back of my hand. I'm comfortable. I'm pretty good at it. And that's what I'll do. Well, the bear uh, was my backseater in Spain a number of years earlier. And he was navigator. And uh, we, were, we were a great team. Uh, he was my best man at our wedding. Uh, he was a hell of a good guy and, uh, and a very, very talented aviator. And the Air Force finally recognized this and uh, sent him to pilot training. He came out of pilot training and went to the A-7, single seat, uh, ground attack airplane, probably the, if you would, the, the forerunner to the A-10 in terms of close air support and that type of thing. And uh, he'd been flying the A-7 
and just happened to pass through uh, the UK and came up to visit us at Bentwaters just about the time I was uh, going to have to make a, a firm decision and uh, sign the dotted line for what I wanted to do. Uh, we sat down and uh, Elaine prepared us, a, prepared us a lovely meal and we did that and we jumped into the, uh, into the single malt scotch bottle and we got to talking and she got fed up and went to bed and we continued and uh, I said, no, nah. I said, I'm not sticking, I'm not going into the A-10. I said, it's ugly and it's slow and it's this and that and the other. I had all these, uh, all these incredibly clever arguments to, uh, to justify uh, going into the F-4. And he heard me out, and then he said, now, for, for a guy who's pretty bright, Steve, you can be awfully stupid. <laughs> and I could take that from him because uh, we, we had developed that kind of relationship. But he, he commenced to tell me and, and talk to me about, A, the mission, uh, and the mission, the close air support mission, as opposed to uh, the jack-of-all-trades routine in the F-4. And he told me all about that, and he told me how, how gratifying it was to fly a, the close air support mission to support guys on the ground, which I'd done very little of. And then he talked about uh, flying a single-seat airplane, not having to uh, make decisions by committee, uh, and uh, not having to worry about uh, somebody else in the airplane with you. So by the time the night was over, and I was, uh, oh, I, I suppose I was still reasonably conscious, he talked me into A, the mission, and B, the airplane. And um, I am grateful to him to this day for doing that, because uh, I've never looked back. Uh, it was the best thing I ever did. And I went into the personnel office on Monday morning and signed up for the Warthog. And uh, the rest is history. It was great. That's a great story and a, and a fortunate transition, I, I think. So when you transitioned from the, the F-4 to the A-10, what was that like getting used to, as you said, uh, you know, you flew slower, but you also flew a lot lower. Absolutely. Yeah. The A-10 was built to fly low. Uh, it's a much slower airplane. The best you're going to get out of her uh, in a screaming dive is about 400 knots. But so what? That's not the role. Yeah, the airplane, uh, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. The airplane itself to fly, just to fly, to get in the air, to uh, uh, wander around, to do some aerobatics, to bring back and land is very, very simple. The mission itself is, is ultra complex. And it takes an awful lot of thought and an awful lot of smarts, and it takes an awful lot of teamwork with other airplanes, people on the ground, and all the rest to uh, do what you need to do if you're going to support uh, a bunch of grunts down there that, uh, that are having problems with, uh, with the bad guys. I flew my entire A-10 career, was flown in the A model, which was the first model, and uh, it was built, like uh, most airplanes here play the Air Force builds, uh, it was built to save money. Uh, and consequently, the airplane itself was very, very simple. It was uh, pretty much a World War II airplane with jet M engines. Uh, avionics were next to nothing. We, uh, For an airplane that was supposed to run around at 100 feet uh, over the ground, we had no inertial navigation system. No, uh, no magic of any kind, and but of course that made better pilots out of us. But uh, it uh, it kind of detracted from uh, from some of the uh, some of the things that uh, that airplanes with uh, with the magic can do. Didn't didn't daunt us though. We uh, we uh, figured out a way to navigate. We figured out a way to do what we needed to do. We got real good at dropping bombs. And then all of a sudden, it was time to shoot that gun. And that changed the whole world for me. The gun uh, is, uh, well, the only way to put it is awe-inspiring. Just very briefly for, for, for listeners who aren't aware of it, uh, it's called the GAU-8. Contrary to popular opinion, they didn't build the gun first and the airplane around it. Almost, though. The specification was for a gun that would kill armor, and they had to uh, they had to do some fairly sporty modifications on the airplane so it would fit in. But what they came up with was uh, absolutely dazzling. 
The gun uh, is capable of firing 70 beer bottle size projectiles, 30 millimeter projectiles per second. I'll say that again, uh, 70 per second. And uh, the, uh, the gun is incredibly accurate. The combat mix is, uh, is a combination of uh, uh, armor-piercing incendiary and high-explosive incendiary. And uh, it's a five-to-one mix. Uh, the uh, armor-piercing incendiary punches holes in the tank, and the uh, high-explosive incendiary bounces around inside and uh, makes things very, very miserable for the crew. Uh, but the gun is, in, is incredibly accurate. It fires, as I say, 70 a second, 4,200 rounds a minute, but we only carried 1,170 rounds. And people will say, well, that doesn't equate, doesn't work out mathematically. Well, it does sort of because you only need to squeeze off about a second's worth to do what you want to do on any given pass. So that's 70 rounds. So 1,170, which is what you carry, is plenty for the average mission. The gun is something that the first time you fire it at the range, uh, it just makes your eyes water. Once again, the, uh, the gun sight was very basic. It was just a gun cross at 41 mils. Uh, you put it on the target, squeeze the trigger for a half a second or a second. You watch this great clump of, uh, of bullets hit the target, and they do hit pretty near the target unless you're really bad at, at, at what you're aiming at and uh it uh, it just it just makes you it just makes you want to shout <laughs> which i did many times i can imagine i'm sure the entire airframe is just vibrating right when you're firing that thing yeah definitely definitely the uh, the other story goes that when you fire it uh, the airplane slows down i i suppose it probably would but again you fire such short bursts that it doesn't have quite that much effect on the speed yeah, and I imagine typically you're in a dive as well, right? Because you're shooting something on the ground. Um, normally, but not necessarily much of a dive. Um, we did an awful lot of level scrape and a very low angle scrape, four or five degrees of uh, descent, I would say, rather than dive, because uh, you don't really want to get up where people can shoot at you to uh, come in with, a, with much of a dive angle. So you do an awful lot of work uh, very, very low. Yeah, that makes sense. When you were deployed uh, or when you were in the A-10, your career was progressing and you were, you were gaining rank and, of course, responsibility, uh, which ultimately led to being the director of operation at, at Bentwaters for the 81st Tactical Fighter Wing. At that time, I believe it was the largest uh, operational fighter aircraft squadron in the world, mostly consisting of A-10s. What was it like being at that base and, and managing all those aircraft and pilots? Busy. <laughs> It was a great job. It was, uh, it was, it was truly great. As you say, uh, we had 108 A-10s, uh, six squadrons, 18 aircraft each. We had one squadron of, uh, of F-16 aggressors that uh, did the job uh, throughout Europe. They deployed, they fought against fighter airplanes all over Europe just to uh, uh, do that dissimilar type of uh, air combat tactics. And not only did we have the uh, operations the 81st is centered on twin bases, uh, the bases at Bentwaters and Woodbridge, which are side by side in Suffolk. They're only a couple of miles apart, uh, but you, uh, we operated off both runways, and uh, with that many squadrons, uh, I'm sure that pretty much decided where they'd go. In addition to the twin bases and the twin main operating bases, we had four forward operating locations in uh, Germany. And they pretty much spanned Germany from north to south. There was one in, uh, in, in pretty much in the very north called uh, Alhorn at a German base. Uh, the next one south was near uh, the city of Cologne. Uh, and I spent uh, three years there as the operations officer. Uh, that was at uh, Norvenik, which was a, a German fighter base. A little further south in central Germany was uh, another forward operating location at Sembach, which was an American base uh, in the Kaiserslautern area. And then finally, down in Bavaria, uh, the fourth FOL was Leipheim, and that too was at a German base. The concept was if the uh, Russians ever came charging across the inner German border with all their armor, uh, we would fight from these four FOLs. 
Uh, the airplanes would deploy there. They, they were deployed there to train all the time anyway, but they would deploy there. The FOLs were capable of arming them, refueling them, and doing relatively minor maintenance on them so they could fly and fight out of the forward operating locations for, uh, for uh, um, heavier damage or heavier problems. Uh, we'd have to get the airplanes back to Bentwaters and Woodbridge, the main bases where the main maintenance complex was. But uh, the, uh, the concept was to have aircraft on the ground that were capable of meeting the threat uh, very, very quickly if the, uh, if the Russians decided to jump. Uh, and it was a great concept. It was, it was super. The, uh, the pilots loved it. They spent a lot of time in Germany uh, flying around at low level and getting used to the terrain. And uh, uh, we had a good time there. It was it was super. That really was the tip of the spear because if anything started or broke out, I mean, you were going to be right there. And in the book, you mentioned you know this large concentration of all these fighter aircraft uh, and kind of mixing it up and and mock dog fighting and and doing all kinds of uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> jousting, I guess, or you know cat and mouse games. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like and what that airspace? Was like yeah yeah I will Juan because I can't get in trouble for that anymore it was <laughs> it was a long time ago uh, that's exactly right I mean during the height of the Cold War there were so many Allied aircraft working out of the Central Europe primarily out of Germany uh, and uh, Belgium the Netherlands that area the Brits were there in force the Belgians the Germans the Dutch uh, the Americans of course. And uh, there were all sorts of airplanes. You couldn't, you couldn't drive in your car without seeing a flight of two or a flight of four at low level going one place or another when, uh, when you were in Germany. Um, consequently, the sky was full of them. They were everywhere. And as fighter pilots tend to do, if you see another fighter, you want to go down and gun him. Uh, and that's just, that's just the way it works. Well, the bad news about that is, technically and legally, you're supposed to brief and control all these kind of engagements. And, of course, if you did it with aircraft at your own base, that would be easy enough to do. You sit down and brief with them, and you go out and you fly air combat. Well, that's a little difficult when uh, you uh, go out in your, uh, in your F-16 or your F-4 or your Warthog and you wrap it up with a German and his F-4 or a Brit and a Tornado or whatever. Uh, you can't brief it. There's no way to get around that. Uh, but in fact, uh, it was the best training we could possibly have had because your head was always on a swivel. You were always looking out for other airplanes. You were always looking out for somebody that wanted to jump you. And believe me, everyone wanted to jump you. So you'd go up and fly uh, some kind of a mission. I don't know what it was, low level or uh, a mission to the gunnery ranges or whatever. And uh, when you completed that mission and headed for home or on the way out, uh, somebody was more than likely going to bounce you. And when they did, uh, you know, nobody was going to just say, I'm going to waggle my wings and I'm going to be a good boy. and I'm going to go home. Nah. Somebody jumps you, you've got to, you've got to meet the threat. So uh, that's what happened day in and day out. The air battles were epic. Uh, they, were, they were really something. I can, remember, I can remember tying it up with 12, 15 airplanes, uh, all looping and diving and rolling and pulling in the same little bit of sky. The only thing that, uh, that we had of, of a reasonable safety uh, net was the ability to come on the, the emergency guard frequency and say, knock it off. If things went bad, if a problem occurred, you could go on guard and say, knock it off, and everyone would stop the battle. I've got to say, I never heard that. Never heard that once when I was over there. And uh, although it was illegal, and although they'd have hung us up by our ghoulies if they caught us doing it, it was the greatest training we could possibly have had. Yeah, that makes sense because it's not planned and you have to be, you have to react to a developing situation. And I, I believe also you mentioned on the same guard frequency, people would broadcast their kills or their, you know, getting behind somebody and calling out, uh, calling someone out for being, for being nailed. 
Oh, absolutely. That's the that's the embarrassment factor. Uh, if you uh, if you had a if you had a valid shot, uh, you'd uh, you'd come up on guard and say so. Guns, guns on the uh, British Jaguar heading northeast uh, above uh, above Cologne. You know, not everybody would know who he was, but some folks would, and he'd uh, he'd be a little bit embarrassed later. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this excerpt, I encourage you to listen to the podcast episode and pick up a copy of the book, which goes into more details of Steve's experiences, including his time at the Fighter Weapons School as a student and then an instructor. Links are in the description below. What do you think? Are dedicated platforms like the A-10 still needed? Was the F-4 the most versatile fighter ever built? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you'd like to see more content like this, go ahead and click the subscribe button and then the bell for notifications. Stay safe and see you next time.